better. Hello, good afternoon everyone. I hope you're all having a good day. As you know, we're doing a study on the Book of Jonah. Yesterday we spent rather a lengthy bit of time over looking at the background and everything about Jonah and the life and the people around and the nations around him and what was going on at the time. We've discovered that Jeroboam the second was on the throne and um, Jonah became a prophet about that time. You know, we can't, we can't actually be accurate as to the dates, but it's approximate dates we discussed yesterday. So Lord, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that we can study your word together. We can go through book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. Because Lord, there is still a message for us in the word of God, even from the Old Testament today. We thank you, Lord, that you've given it to us. And we can look at the lives of these men and women and discover areas in our lives where we are very similar. Lord, I pray that you would help us today and help us to turn to you in every situation. Amen. Well, today I'll start by reading again. We read the first four verses yesterday, but we'll read it again today. Jonah forsakes his mission and Jonah runs away from God. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from unto Tarshish. As we'll discover, Tarshish was in Spain, so he was going the complete opposite, if you look at a map of the Mediterranean Sea, complete opposite directions and to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, which is a seaport on the edge of the Mediterranean, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them, and to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was, be was like to be broken. Then the mariners, or we would call them sailors, were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, with a small g, and cast forth the wares that there were in the ship into the sea. They were getting rid of everything that was going to make them some money when they sold them. So they were waiting in the load on the ship, so the ship wouldn't sink quite so fast, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Remind me of somebody else in the storm? Remind you of somebody else? When Jesus fell asleep on the boat. There was a different circumstances there. But Jesus was woken up and he calmed the storm. Jonah, the storm was calmed when Jonah was thrown into the sea, as we read on. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, we would call the shipmaster the captain in these days. What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, his friend, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for who co whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots. It's like we would do in this day and age. We would draw straws, held on straws. You had one long straw, a medium sized straw, and a tiny straw, remember? And you draw it out of your hand. Well, it's their way of finding, picking the person that was guilty. And the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for thou cause this evil, well, whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? Even Jonah would, didn't even tell them that he was a prophet, and he was, he was just told him he was running away from God. You know, he was even hiding his ministry and his calling, even to the shipboard people, but he had to tell them and confess that it's his fault. And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, What hast thou done? What hast thou done this? Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, 
because he had told them. Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous, very dangerous and stormy. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Well, at least he was admitting his mistake, and yet he, he still thought he was going to get away with doing what God wanted, even when he was about to be thrown over. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. They didn't chuck him over yet, just yet. Rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, we beg thee, in other words, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done it as it pleaseth thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from a raging. The men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. They came to believe in God then, didn't they? Rather than they are little gods, they man-made gods and the things they put before the real God, they came to recognise that God was in charge of the sea and all the things and their lives. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of this, the fish, three days and three nights. Sounds like to me when Jesus was in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights is an example of that. Well, let's have a little look at some notes today. There are still more notes we can cover. Some of it may repeat what we learned yesterday. Verse 1 and 2 in Jonah chapter 1. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings 14.25. We had a good look at that yesterday and we read the passage. He prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam the second, the king of Israel from 793 to 753 BC. He may have been one of the young prophets of the school mentioned in connection with Elisha's ministry, 2 Kings 2-3. We're not really sure about that, but he could have been. God called Jonah to preach to Nineveh, the most important city in Assyria, the rising world of Jonah's day, world power of Jonah's day. Within 50 years, Nineveh would become the capital of the vast Assyrian Empire. Jonah doesn't say much about Nineveh's wickedness, but the prophet Nahum, which we will look at, if we look at the, later on we will look at the book of Nahum, gives us more insight. He says that Nineveh was guilty of one, evil plots against God, which we read in Nahum 1 verse 9, Two, exploitation of the helpless, Nahum 2, verse 12. Three, cruelty in war, Nahum 2, verse 12 and 13. Four, idolatry, prostitution and witchcraft, Nahum 3, verse 4. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, about 500 miles northeast of Israel, to the warn of judgment and to declare that the people could receive mercy and forgiveness if they repented. We'll find that Jonah didn't even preach that God would forgive them. He just preached the judgment was coming and they repented themselves. Nineveh, verse 3, was a powerful and wicked city. Jonah grew up hating the Assyrians and fearing their atrocities. His hatred was so strong that he didn't want them to receive God's mercy. Jonah was actually afraid the people would repent. Chapter 4, verse 2, verse 3, when, when, he, when he says it to God, he talks and argues with God about it later on. Jonah at, at, Jonah's attitude is representative of Israel's reluctance to share God's love and mercy with others, even though it was, this was their God-given mission. Genesis 12, verse 3. We have discussed that a little bit, where God told them that they were to be an example to the nations, that all nations may come to the knowledge of the truth and come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. But Israel, was they were like Jonah, did not want non-Jews or Gentiles to obtain God's favour. As I said, they called the Gentiles like dogs. 
they were worthless because they were not Jews. But God was well, God changed this. And because the Jews rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, he took the message to us. Although God will save the Jews again, but how we are still living in the time of the Gentiles. But that will soon come to an end if you look at world history. Once the temple is built in Jerusalem and all of that, the time of the Gentiles will end. Jonah was afraid. He knew God had a specific job for him, but he didn't want to. Has God got us called you into a specific role and you've said, I don't want to? Well, God will work on you and he will get you into that position in the end if he doesn't choose to use somebody else, which he can do either. When God gives us direction through his word, sometimes we run in fear, claiming that God is asking too much. There are many people today who won't become Christians because they believe there's too many rules and regulations, they can't go and get drunk, they can't sleep around, they can't do all these other things. It's too hard, they say. But God only says these things for our benefit. Look at the results of alcoholism. Look at the results of are sleeping with so many different people and partners when AIDS comes in and all these sexually transmitted diseases. God warned us about these things. He didn't want us to go down that way. But people still think that following Jesus they'd have to give up all their sinful ways. But there's a better way. When you do give your life to Jesus Christ, life is different. It can be hard sacrificing those things that you want to do and you know you shouldn't do. But God will ultimately will have our prize in heaven. We'll have a we can have some of that blessing here on earth for being faithful to God's word. They were they thought God was asking too much. Fear made Jonah run. But running got him into worse trouble in the end. Yeah, you run away from God, eventually he's gonna catch up with you. He understood it best. To do, he understood it is best to do what God asks in the first place. But by then he had paid a costly price but for running. It is far better to obey from the start. God expects obedience from the start. Before setting in, settling in the promised land, the Israelites had been a nomadic people. They wandered from place to place, seeking good pasture land for their flocks. Although they were not a sea affair in people, their location along the Mediterranean Sea and near the neighbouring maritime powers of Phoenicia and Philistia allowed much contact with ships and sailors. The ship Jonah sailed on was probably a large trading vessel with a deck. Verse 4. Jonah's disobedience to God endangered the lives of the ship's crew. We have a great responsibility to obey God's word because our sin and disobedience can hurt others around us. As we were said before, there are always consequences to our actions for disobedience and doing things that are not right. It does affect other people. It does affect friends and family and people that you that love you and care about you when they know that you do it. You know you're doing something wrong, but you don't say you don't care, but you go ahead and do it anyway. And it hurts your friends and family because they love you and care about you. As God loves and cares about you. It can hurt other people. There are consequences to every action. Verse 4 and 5. While the storm raged, Jonah was found sound asleep in the ship. Even as he ran from God, he apparently didn't have a guilty conscience. His heart had become hardened, I think. But the absence of guilt isn't always a barometer of whether we're doing right. Because we can deny reality, we can me cannot measure obedience by our feelings. Instead, we must compare what we do with God's standards for living. Sometimes you can be doing a sin so much, the same sin over and over, you get to the point you don't feel guilty about it anymore. You lose your sense of your conscience. Stops, uh, does, stops you, uh, stops pricking your conscience, as they say. 
making you feel guilty because you know it's wrong. But when you continue in the sin for so long, it just becomes a normal part of life. Um, it's like they say, it takes two to three weeks to develop a new habit. But when you're doing the committing the same sin over and over, eventually you become hardened to the guilt that you would normally feel when you did it the first time. Whatever that sin may be. Because we, know we can deny, deny reality, we cannot measure obedience by our feelings. Instead, we must compare what we do with God's standards for living. God has a standard. He has a plumb line we've discussed before. He has a measuring. He measures everything and you're either one side or the other or you're above, you know. That's how it is with God. He has a standard and he wants us to be up here, not down there. Verse 7, the crew cast lots like drawing straws. Oh, I didn't read that before. See, I... I was thinking along those lines to find the guilty person, relying on their superstitions to give them the answer. Their system worked, but only because God intervened to let Jonah know he couldn't run away from him. Are you running away from God in your life at the moment? Are you running away from something God wants you to do? Well, come back to him, because you'll only end up in disaster and in a mess like Jonah did. But if you turn and you obey God, you will know his blessings. You cannot seek God's love and run from him at the same time, 9 to 12. Jonah soon realised that no matter where he went, he could not get away from God. But before Jonah could reach return to God, he first had to stop running away from him. What has God told you to do? If you want more of God's love and power, you must be willing to carry out the responsibilities he gives you. You cannot truly say that you truly believe in God if you don't do what he says. That's a very important point. You can't say that you truly love God unless you obey and do what he says to, that he's asked you to do. Verse 12, Jonah knew he had disobeyed and that the storm was his fault. But he didn't say anything until the crew cast lots and the lot fell on him. Then he was willing to give his life to save the sailors, although he had refused to do the same for the people of Nineveh. Jonah's hatred for the Assyrians had affected his perspective. Have you lost your perspective because you hate someone or you've got a disagreement with someone? But God wants you to forgive and then go and do what he's asked you to do. Because if God won't forgive you unless you forgive the sins of others. Verse 13. By trying to save Jonah's life, the heathen sailors showed more compassion than Jonah did. For Jonah did not want to warn the people of Nineveh of the coming judgment of God. Believers should be, un be ashamed when unbelievers show more concern and compassion than they do. It's often true, isn't it? That uh, unbelievers often show more love and compassion towards someone than us Christians do. It's not good, is it? It should be the other way around. Believers should be ashamed when unbelievers show more concern and compassion than they do. God wants us to be concerned about all his people, lost and saved. There's no division. We cannot treat anybody different. The lost people, those who are not Christians, and those who are Christians. This is what it says in here. Chapter 4, verse 16. See, he was willing to sacrifice himself for the men on the boat, but not for the people God had called him to. God wants us to be concerned about all his people, lost and saved. Chapter 1, verse 14 to 16. Jonah had disobeyed God. While he was running away, he stopped and submitted to God. Then the ship's crew began to worship God because they saw the storm quiet down. God is able to use even our mistakes to help others come to know him. It may be painful, but admitting our sins can be a powerful example to those who don't know God. How ironic that the pagan sailors did 
what the entire nation of Israel would not do. Pray to God about the servant. Verse 17. Many have tried to dismiss this miraculous event as fiction, but the Bible does not describe it as a dream or a legend. We should not explain away this miracle as if we can pick and choose which of the miracles in the Bible is to believe. There are many people who pick and choose. I don't believe that bit of the Bible, but I believe this bit of the Bible. We have to believe the whole word of God, not just the bits that suit us, that seem comfortable to us. We have to accept the whole in the, of the Bible. This kind of attitude allows us to question any part of the Bible, cause us to lose our trust in it as God's true and reliable word. Jonah's experience was used by Christ himself as an illustration of his death and resurrection. We did mention that, but you can read more on that in Matthew 12, verse 39 and 40. Jonah was sent by God to the Assyrians, ran from the task and was swallowed by a great fish. The Bible tells us that he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then he was delivered and went to Nineveh where the people responded with repentance. Those events in Jonah's life were cited by Jesus. Think about it. If he was shipwrecked back in the Mediterranean, he still had to cross all of that land and travel maybe on foot all the way to Nineveh. You know, if he had done that in the first place, he wouldn't have had to, you know, he wouldn't have had to suffer the consequences. He'd have just had one journey rather than two. Jonah 17, the one seventeen. Jonah was sent by God to the Assyrians, ran from the task and was swallowed by a great. The Bible tells that, well, we read that bit, didn't we? Let's, let's jump that again. When the religious leaders demanded that Jesus give them a sign to prove his authority, Jesus said the only sign they would receive was the sign of Jonah. They could see Jesus swallowed by death and delivered for three days after three days. Matthew 12, verse 39 to 41, and 16, verse 4. Jesus was making it very clear to the religious leaders of the day that their stubbornness to believe in him would be judged. The people of Nineveh responded to God's word by Jonah, but the religious leaders in Jerusalem and Israel refused to believe God's word spoken by his very own son. Often people of our generation demand a sign from God, but the only sign they will receive is the sign of Jonah, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1. There's some more interesting stuff here, so I'm going to read it as, you, as I'm reading some of the notes I'm reading are from the Life Application Bible, King James Version. Let's look at this a bit. It sounds interesting. Two Old Testament personalities compare in transparency with the prophet Jonah. If you think about it, every other prophet we've looked at, we've looked at the man the ma and the message that he preached. Here we're looking at the man, mainly. Although he still preached the gospel, we don't know exactly words that he used in his preaching, but it didn't concern much on what word he had and the message he had, but on the person themselves and God is concerned with the person the heart of a person and the, the desires of the person I'm looking for obedience as we've always said jo we can see Joseph transparent can't we we can almost see through him we can see right through him and most of it most of what we see we don't like he reminds us too much of ourselves yeah, sometimes we run away from God, don't we? Fearful, selfish, spiteful and proud. Even when Jonah wasn't physically running away from God, he was still resisting on the inside. He was quite capable of putting on a show of obedience to cover a seething internal mutiny. Yeah, there could be many people going to church who... You know, can put on a good show, a good front on the outside, put a mask on, 
you know, pretend everything is all right, but inside they're full of hate, despising people, uh, you know, holding grudges, but can pr pretend on the outside that things were okay. And that's what it's talking about, what it reminds of us. Of us. Even when Jonah wasn't physically running away from God, he was still resisting on the inside. How many times are we resisting God and God's spirit convicting us? He was quite capable of putting on a show of obedience to cover a seething internal mutiny. Do we mutiny? Do we rebel against our captain, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ and God? We often do, don't we? Because we don't want to do things his way, we want to do things my way. As our song goes, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Well, we should do things God's way. We've heard that said a few times in the past. When he finally arrived in Nineveh with God's message, he delivered it as a summary judgment. He offered no way of escape. Jonah flatly declared the city's destruction, and that's what he wanted. He still obeyed God, he still went and preached the message, but he still wanted to see the city's destruction. Jonah knew, as he admitted later, that God was a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Verse 2, four, verse, chapter 2, verse 2. He hoped the Ninevites wouldn't listen and was so offended and resentful when they did, Jonah suffered under the painful mistake of assuming that he was the centre of the universe. <laughs> How often do we think that we're the centre of the universe and it's all about me, 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 me. When it's not about us, it's about us serving God and serving others, isn't it? Some people do not think about God until they become angry. Discouragement, disappointment and disgust seem to clear away the highs around God. And we're all too eager to blame him for our troubles. Yeah, we do. We do that when things go wrong, but it's usually because we've gone the wrong way and we're reaping the rewards of going the wrong way. Not God. God doesn't bring it on us. We bring it on ourselves. We bring judgment on ourselves. And, by you know, like we've heard before, we don't tell someone the message and they, go to, they suffer. We're bringing judgment on ourselves. But God wants us to continually share his message of salvation and repentance with others and in ourselves too. God bluntly confronted Jonah with the reality of his disobedience. The pettiness of his demand was com for comfort and the sinfulness of his blatant disregard for others. The wonderful character of God. Yeah, he is wonderful God. But Jonah wanted to withhold from the Ninevites. He himself had been taken for granted. He took for granted how wonderful and merciful God was. Fortunately, God will be just as blunt with us. He will shatter our comfort if that will place uh, shatter our comfort if that will place us in the best place to meet with him. He'll make us uncomfortable until we cry out to him and meet with him. As long as we are surrounded by our sense of control and our pride and everything else, we want to be in control, we want to be number one, instead of placing God as number one. As long as we are surrounded by our sense of comfort and importance, we will not know God as God. What has God done lately in your life to open your eyes a little wider? Yeah, good question. What has God done in your life to open your eyes a bit wider recently? Jonah's strengths and accomplishments was sent and finally went to an enemy nation with God's message, survived an encounter with a large fish, was instrumental in the repentance of the population of a huge city, keeping it from destruction. His weaknesses and mistakes Thought he could avoid God's call in his life by running away. Think about it. This is what we do. Though he thought he could avoid God's call by sacrificing himself. So he was going to be thrown in the sea so that the other people wouldn't suffer. 
and then he would be dead, so he wouldn't have to, still wouldn't have to go. Thought he could avoid God's call by beleaguered, beleaguered obedience. Thought he could nullify God's call by sulking. <laughs> How up the, do we sulk? Yeah, when we can't get things our own way, we sulk, don't we? Lessons from his life. God cares deeply for us as well as for people we resent and hate. God will, will. Do not again, God will accomplish his purposes, even though reluctant and unwilling servants we are. Often. God is patient with sinners and patient with his uh, sinners. Read that again. God is patient with sinners and patient with his servants. The vital syntax says, where was this? Gath Hefer. That's where, where he was, when he was called, Second Kings 14.25. His occupation was a prophet. His relatives, as we've all discovered so far, it was, his father was Amitai. We haven't got no other record of his relatives. Key verse, but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But God is everywhere, isn't he? You know, we can't go anywhere. If we go to the heights of the mountains or we go to the deeper sea or wherever, God's presence is still there. Yeah, so let's remember those things that we've learned today. I've been challenged by this so far, and I hope you have as well. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us to be obedient to the call that you've given us. Lord, we have many, many times heard your call, but then tried to get away with it and tried to hide and run away with it. And eventually you bring us to the end of ourselves and then you use us to bring about your purposes. Lord, help us not to be resentful, hateful of anyone, Lord, that's done anything against us, but to forgive them, as your prayer says. Forgive us our trespasses, the things we've done wrong, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Help us to obey you in every aspect of our lives. Our Lord, as a theme for this year, I know it's October and I keep saying the same things, Lord. I thank you for the theme you give us, to put God first in everything, and then we will know his blessing, we will know his power and his victory in our lives. Amen. Thank you for listening again today. If you've enjoyed this message and you'd like to listen to more, please subscribe to the channel on YouTube. And uh, if so, share and if you like it, share it with others, and, sh and ring the bell button because it will give you more messages when I upload more messages. But share them with other people. This message is not about me; it's a message about God and what God wants to do for us even today. God's not finished with us, and God has a mighty work and a powerful work for each one of us to do for Him. He's called you and chosen you before the foundations of the world. Amen. God bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you his peace. Shalom. Amen.